Would you turn with me to Leviticus chapter 16, uh, please? Leviticus 16, uh, page 170 in the Church Bibles. Uh, quite near the beginning of the Bibles. Page 170, Leviticus chapter 16. And uh, let's read this chapter of God's Word. Well, we'll read it in just a minute, actually. Let me just say a few words before we uh, get to it. Um, just hold it there. Page 170, Leviticus 16, we'll read in a moment. So so far in uh, in our series on Sunday mornings, we've been looking at some of the Old Testament scriptures that speak clearly about Jesus. And some of these passages are, are quoted many times in the New Testament. Some of those we looked at, some of the Psalms especially, are quoted all over the place. Uh, uh, as, they speak, uh, as they speak about Jesus, or they speak about one who would come, who can be none other than Jesus. There's nobody else who fits the description that is given. So they're quite clear. We looked at some Psalms and some passages from uh, the prophets there, from Isaiah, Jeremiah. But there are lots of other uh, scriptures that speak uh, less directly about Jesus. They still speak about him, but it's less uh, direct and less explicit. They speak about him as he, uh, as he fulfills the pictures that they give us of some aspect of, of the gospel of our salvation or of God's character. And uh, some of these uh, passages refer to themes that are picked up repeatedly uh, throughout the Bible. And they have a kind of trajectory, they have a destination, uh, if you like, that ends with Jesus. So when you first read them, and if you read them apart from the rest of the Bible, you, you might not at first realise where they're headed. But if you read the whole of the Bible and you see uh, where they come in, you will see repeated themes and you'll, you'll see how Jesus comes to fulfil them, how he kind of inhabits those themes. And uh, I think this morning is, is one like that, really. I think the next couple that we're going to do of these will be a bit more like that. There'll be less a verse, you know, that's quoted and obviously is about Jesus, but more of these uh, kind of theme ones. And uh, I think this morning is quite, it is quite a big one. I don't propose to say everything about it, um, but it is a key one for understanding what Jesus came to do by his, by his life and death and resurrection. So the video hopefully was, was helpful. Uh, and there are other uh, Bible project, project videos that might be useful to watch too. There's ones on holiness, for instance, and there's ones on the, on the book of Leviticus again. But they point us, I hope you saw that on the video, point us to uh, the structure, the sort of the, the, um, the way that Leviticus is laid out and the, the fact that these chapters 16 and 17 are kind of in the middle and are key for that reason that they are being pointed to um, and highlighted for us. Um, if you remember, we looked at Leviticus during lockdown. I did check my records, and it was actually, I think, the second sermon that that we preached when, once we couldn't meet together in lockdown. The first one, I, I did something on coronavirus and our response to it, and the second one, when we couldn't meet together in March 2020, was on this passage because we'd spent a bit of time looking at Leviticus before that. Um, so some of the things I'll probably repeat, but um, it won't be exactly the same. But I want to look at this chapter again uh, this morning. Um, and as we think about what's going on here, we'll see, hopefully we'll see this trajectory that leads us to, to Christ. So having said that, let me read it to you. So Leviticus 16, and uh, let's, let's read the detail of this. And some of it you'll say, well, there's quite a lot of detail there, but we need, we need to hear God's word, don't we? This is God's word as well as everything else that we read. So Leviticus 16, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron who died when they approached the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark or else he will die because I appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. This is how Aaron is to enter the sanctuary area with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments. So he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and one, sorry, and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat <coughs> shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the desert as a scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household, <coughs> and he is to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. He is to take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense 
and take them behind the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord, and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above the testimony, so that he will not die. He is to take some of the bull's blood, and with his finger sprinkle it on the front of the atonement cover. Then he shall sprinkle some of it with his finger seven times before the atonement cover. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people, and take its blood behind the curtain, and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. In this way, he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites, whatever their sins have been. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household and the whole community of Israel. Then he shall come out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He shall take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on all the horns of the altar. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times to cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the Israelites. When Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place, and the man shall release it into the desert. Then Aaron is to go into the tent of meeting and take off the linen garments he put on before he entered the most holy place, and he is to leave them there. He shall bathe himself with water in a holy place and put on his regular garments. Then he shall come out and sacrifice the burnt offering for himself and the burnt offering for the people to make atonement for himself and for the people. He shall also burn the fat of the sin offering on the altar. The man who releases the goat as a scapegoat must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterwards he may come into the camp. The bull and the goat for the sin offerings whose blood was brought into the most holy place to make atonement must be taken outside the camp. Their hides, flesh and offal are to be burned up. The man who burns them must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterwards he may come into the camp. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. On the tenth day of the seventh month, you must deny yourselves and not do any work with a native born or an alien living among you, because on this day, atonement will be made for you to cleanse you. Then before the Lord, you will be clean from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of rest and you must deny yourselves. It is a lasting ordinance. The priest who is anointed and ordained to succeed his father as high priest is to make atonement. He is to put on the sacred linen garments and make atonement for the most holy place, for the tent of meeting and the altar, and for the priests and all the people of the community. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sins of the Israelites. And it was done as the Lord commanded Moses. Amen. There's a lot of detail there, but we're going to go through some of it and, and hopefully uh, we'll, uh, we'll see this trajectory leading to, us to Christ. Um, the whole book of Leviticus, uh, as, as perhaps you remember and perhaps as we saw there on the film as well, is about how uh, a, a God who is awesomely holy wants to dwell with his sinful people, uh, which is good news for us, of course, which is why the gospel is good news. God graciously gave his people these instructions so that they might come before him and and know his presence with them, so that he might dwell with them. And at this point then, there is a a certain degree of separation required for them. Their sin might be the end of them in the presence of God's perfection, God's holiness. Um, We learned a little bit about separation, didn't we, during COVID. But in a similar way to to our enforced separation, here in Leviticus, it was for their good. They couldn't just enter God's presence any way they liked, whenever they liked. And we have that reminder just in verse one there of chapter 16 to a, a, a previous incident back in chapter 10 where two of Aaron's sons did just uh, come into God's presence. We don't exactly know uh, uh, what they did, but maybe because of their mention here, they went in without observing the commands of God, without observing the, the process that God had given. And they died. You know, their lives were forfeit for doing that. But these instructions given to Israel here are so that their sin may be taken care of and dealt with. Um, so verse 30, because of this, because on this day of atonement, says God at the end, uh, oh, sorry, because on this 
day atonement will be made for you to cleanse you. Then before the Lord you'll be cleansed from all your sins. This chapter is all about sin and about God's holiness and about how our sin can be atoned for so that we might stand in God's presence without fear. And that's that's our gospel hope, isn't it? In the Lord Jesus. So we'll, we'll get to that point in a moment, but we've got a bit of detail to look over first. So as we look over this chapter, I want us to uh, think through first to see why this day was needed and uh, then we'll think about what the priest had to do on this day some of the details there because they'll be helpful for us and then finally we'll we'll see and and think about what this means for us now because this isn't just uh, ancient history and maybe you might say well some some are interested and some aren't no this points us forward to what Jesus would do for us these are the scriptures says Jesus that speak about him and these scriptures speak about him so uh, we need to get to that at the end Okay, so firstly then, why why was this day needed? Um, Well, um, through the obedience of the people to what God commanded, uh, they could be made right with him. The offence of their sin could be removed. They could enjoy fellowship with God. Uh, The tabernacle was deliberately right in the middle of the camp of God's people. But the fact that these um, sacrifices that God told them about needed to be repeated all the time shows that their sin also was repeated. It wasn't that they uh, you know, were cleansed and that was the end of sin for them. They lived perfectly after that. No, there were daily sacrifices. There were sacrifices in response to uh, sinful actions. There were annual feasts with sacrifices and it just went on and on because people were always becoming unclean and they were in need of sacrifice. And the things that uh, make them unclean as I think it, they tried to show in the video, we're all to do in some way with death. God is the author of life and all the things that made God's people impure and clean were, were connected to death. And so death was constantly, if you like, invading their experience of life with God. And this one day a year, this day of atonement was a special day and it still is, isn't it, for Jews, even today. And it was a kind of, a kind of catch-all for sins that had been missed in all the other regulations. Uh, the priest is included in this. So the offerings are for him too and his household before he can offer for the people. Um, In uh, verse uh, 16 and uh, verses 18 and 19, it says, The priest is making atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites. So he makes it atonement, if you like, for even the place where this worship takes place, for the tent and for the altar and everything, to cleanse this space where God dwells. Uh, Because the sin of God's people separates them from God if if it's not dealt with. God is committed to dwell with his people. He doesn't just say, well, I'm holy and you're not, and that's the end of it. He doesn't blast them away, but he's committed to dwell with them. And so he provides this ceremony for their good, to remind them of their sin, to remind them of his holiness, and to provide for them a way into his presence and to point forward to to the way that we can enter God's presence with, with Christ. We'll get to the details in, in just a moment. But uh, just uh, keep that thought uh, for a little while before we get to the details. We are sinful people and we've been like that from the moment we were conceived. And we constantly, we still run from God. We still forsake him. We still fail to trust him and listen to him. We make ourselves unclean and impure all the time. But God is committed by his, as we often read in the Psalms, his unfailing love uh, to people like us. And he himself will provide a way into his presence if we will come in the way that he's commanded it's amazing it is gracious and it is to god's glory and so in all the talk of uh, of impurity which uh, as we saw again in the video may not be sinful it may just be part of life all that talk of uncleanness that corruption of death into god's good world we have also uh, this hope god's good desire and will and plan to bring life uh, his life we could put life with a capital l there his life because he's the author of life. He will not let death have the last word. And you see this at times during Jesus' life. Think of Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus, where it says that he was he was deeply moved. Well, you might just read that and say, well, he was just sad for his friend, but he knew he was going to raise Lazarus. What was, he, what was he reacting against? Death itself, I think. But the gospel is good news because the author of life has defeated death for us. Uh, our saviour is no, he's no distant memory. We don't go to his tomb and... Remember him, he's a vital living reality. And uh, so that's why uh, this day was needed. That's what uh, this was for. 
Well, let's have a think secondly about what the priest had to do then, because some of the detail here will be very helpful for us when we think about what Jesus did by his death. Um, if you read this through this chapter through quickly, like we did just now, it might seem as if the writer is a little bit confused. You know, um, he's he's saying one thing, then he's going back on it and so on. And it is a little bit of a, a, a different way to how we perhaps would write things. But it is, so I'm told, a characteristically, characteristically Hebrew way of writing things. That, so there's an intro, then there's a summary before going back over to fill in some of the details. So there is a bit of repetition, but it's that's the way it's written. It's meant to be like that. Uh, an intro, a summary, and then filling in some detail and then and then summing up at the end. So verses one and two are the kind of intro uh, with that warning about uh, these two guys, Nadab and Abihu, who died. Uh, verses three to five are kind of the summary of what's required, um, animals and clothing and so on. And then the next section, verse six to 10, is kind of summary of what he has to do in brief. And then it fills in the detail in the next few verses. And then at the end, there's a bit of tidying up after the priest has done his work. So there is a bit of repetition, but let me try and sort of explain what the priest had to do just uh, in my own words, and then perhaps we'll get a better handle on it. So the priest needs five animals. He needs a young bull for his own sin, or offer, sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Then he needs the two goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering for the people. And these will be all handled in similar ways to the other offerings that are, are, are in the book of Leviticus. But the goats are different, as you as you know. So one will be killed and its blood used and the other will not be killed but set free. And the priest has to wear certain clothes, but they're different clothes to what he has to wear at other times. If you remember from our studies in Leviticus, some of the time the priest wears richly ornamented clothes, um, full of colour and full of symbols, full of gems and jewels. They have the names of God's people on them and other things written on them. And so those clothes kind of dignify his office and, and uh, what he's doing. And there's glory there and splendor there. But but here it's not like that. Here it's it's just very simple clothes. As you notice, just just linen. That's all he wears. Linen everything. Um, linen tunic, linen sash, linen turban. And there's lots of washing to be done here too as he changes clothes and moves about. For this day as well, uh, there's a difference in that he works alone. At other times the high priest has certain jobs and and he's assisted by his sons and others, family members. But here it's just him, verse 17. No one, no one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out having made atonement for himself, his household and the whole community of Israel. So it's explicit. There's no one else to be there but him. Now he must be alone. And the order is this. He gets dressed and then he offers the bull for his own sin and for the sin of his household and he takes a censer of coals and incense and the blood into the central part of the tabernacle the most holy place the holy of holies and he puts the incense on the fire and the cloud of it fills the temple and hides the ark of the covenant uh, that is the kind of symbol of god's throne so that he won't die it says so that he won't be destroyed um, and then he sprinkles blood on the ark and he kills one of the goats for the sin of the people and he does the same with the bull and he sprinkles blood in the most holy place and also outside on the other items and then he takes the live goat he lays his hands on its head and he confesses the sin of the people over it and so they, they're symbolically kind of transferred to the goat and he, it's sent away never to be seen again then he takes off the special clothes and he washes and he comes out to offer more burnt offerings for himself and the people and then he gets rid of the carcasses outside now, before we get to all what all this means, there are a few interesting things there, aren't there? The priest shares with the people in their sin. And so he represents them. He doesn't say what terrible people they are. Lord, will you bless and, and forgive them? He's, he includes himself in it and he associates with them fully. He has to offer sacrifice for his own sin before he can offer for anyone else. He represents God to the people. Um Sorry, when he represents God to the people, he wears those glorious things. But here, it's, it's kind of the way around. He represents the people to God. And so he wears these plain, simple clothes. And he works alone. There's only one uh, mediator that can accomplish this atonement. And so in the final words of the chapter, it's very clear. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the people. They must attend to this carefully. And they must remember this every year on this special day 
And uh, if, if you look at the date, apparently that date is exactly six months after the Passover. So it's right in the middle of the year after they have remembered God's saving work at Passover. Halfway through the year, they're told to hold this day, uh, which later on is called the Day of Atonement. So it's needed because of the people's sin. And there's all this detail of all this sacrifice and the washing and everything else uh, that the priest is to do. Well, what does, it, what does it all mean? Well, you might ask that <laughs> genuinely. What does it all mean? And what's the point of us knowing all of this? Um, well, these elaborate rituals, these ceremonies, were a kind of symbol language for Israel to teach them spiritual truths and for us too as we understand them. They're to give us, if you like, the the language, the vocabulary that will help us when we understand what, what Jesus comes to do and what we see him fulfilling. And uh, we could have just read the book of Hebrews, couldn't we, this morning? <laughs> and then I could have not preached because that would have been a great commentary on what's going on here. And we'll mention a few verses in a minute. But if you have a read of especially the latter part of Hebrews, chapters uh, 8, 9, 10, you'll see uh, how Jesus comes to fulfill uh, this picture. And what you see... Uh, if you read those chapters in Hebrews, is that this this tent given to Israel, this tabernacle, was was a kind of copy, a shadow of what Jesus would come to do, really, by his death for us. So these things were always pointing us to to him. Uh, the priest would offer regular sacrifices, and work in the outer part of the tent, but the way into God's presence was actually barred. And only once a year, and only the high priest, and only with blood, could he go in. And Hebrews 9 explains that for us here's what it says hebrews 9 verse 8 the holy spirit who inspired these things to be written was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing so it was always it was always the picture and it, you wouldn't see the fulfillment until jesus has, had come um, and then once he'd come you wouldn't need this tabernacle anymore because you'd have the reality and you'd see the reality in jesus the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed until until Jesus comes. And so it's a picture for us of our sin, which is constant, which we fail all the time, separates us from God. But it's also a picture of Christ's work for us that in some ways is like the priest's work on the Day of Atonement, but it's also much, much better, isn't it? Jesus is one of us like the priest was he represents us but as hebrews says rightly there is a difference that these priests as we've just read had to offer for his own sins first but jesus doesn't he doesn't need to offer for his own sins because he never sinned and so he can enter the most holy place not by virtue of the blood of a lamb but by his own blood that he offered for us and uh, he serves like that old priest uh, like that priest of old dressed in humility uh, like him he comes uh, as one of us and he goes there alone because there is only one mediator for us christ himself and he opens the way for us into god's presence not just once a year but once for all so that uh, these verses from hebrews 10 are greatly encouraging to us aren't they uh, hebrews 10 19 therefore brother since we have confidence to enter the most holy place not now the tabernacle tent holy place but the real holy place since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, through what barred us before. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, Hebrews says, here's, here's how it applies. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. In other words, we can come before him. We can come into his presence. Leviticus 16 is all about how you can draw near to God through what Jesus did. It's about how the sin that separates us and pushes us away from God can be dealt with and removed and was dealt with and removed through what Jesus did so that we can be reconciled to him and live in peace with him. So it's about drawing near to God without fear, but in faith in what Christ has done by, by his sacrifice. And so the two goats are are kind of two sides of a coin really it's not two different things they are two aspects of the one work of atonement that jesus did for us so the one goat dies you know, bearing sin it substitutes for the sinner it, it dies so that we don't have to but the other carries the sin far away out of sight no more to be seen 
And those two aspects uh, picture for us what Jesus did. He opens the way for us. He rips the curtain in two so that we can come right into where God is because of all he achieves and our sin is taken away. As far as the east is from the west, the psalmist says, God has removed our sin. Our sin is great, as we uh, sang a, a bit earlier, but his mercy is more. Uh, so you can see, can't you, how this key part of God's law for his people was giving them just the, the words, the, the vocabulary to understand just what Christ would do by his death. And it, wasn't, it wasn't at all, really, that Jesus was a bit like this ancient uh, ritual and ceremony. It was the other way around. This was always God's purpose and plan from the very beginning. We'll probably get to Genesis 3 at some point in this series, I think. But it wasn't that, uh, those, that, that Jesus sort of picked up this picture. It was that God told them this picture because of how it would full, uh, be fulfilled in Christ. It was a kind of prophetic symbol to help us understand the reality of what Jesus would do. It was always pointing to him. Now, I can't remember where I read this. <clears throat> I didn't make a note of where it was, but someone made this helpful connection of a number of these symbols uh, from the Old Testament and the trajectory that leads us to to Jesus through this picture of, uh, of lambs or goats. And here's the, here's the, the connection. And I thought this was good. I, thought this, I think this is right and I think this is good. So you, you, uh, you go back to the Genesis, go back to the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 22, and uh, Abraham and Isaac on the mountain and uh, Isaac is to be offered, but he's spared at the last minute. And uh, the, the ram, the sheep that is there caught in the thicket is offered instead. So you have a one-to-one -one there, basically. The lamb, the ram is offered for the, for the man. But then move forward a bit to Exodus and you have the Passover and you have, you have many uh, lambs being offered. But they're offered in the, the family units, in the family homes. You know, so it's in your house and you put the blood over the doorpost and, and you're, spared, uh, you're spared God's wrath. So there's a lamb there for, for a family. And then... You go to our chapter and you find that there's a, a lamb, a goat there, an animal there for the nation, not just for, for an individual or a family, but for, the, for God's people. And then you follow that through into the New Testament and you see John pointing to Jesus and saying, behold, the Lamb of God, he takes away the sin of the world. And so you can see this kind of picture, this theme that builds through, and I think that's a helpful one, isn't it? A lamb for the, for, for the world. Lamb for man, lamb for the family, lamb for a nation, but it's, it's that, that picture is terminating at Jesus. It's being fulfilled by Jesus. So sin and death have invaded God's good world and separated us from him, but he is the source of life. He is he's the author of life. And so by our sin, by our rebellion, we know the reality of death. We know that physically and we know that spiritually and we know it eternally. Unless God intervenes, and he has, He's not left us in our sin, but he looks upon us in his love and his mercy so that Jesus, the perfect, sinless, obedient Lamb of God, has come. One of us, representing us, able to stand for us. And so he is the priest and the offering at the same time and gives his life for our life to, to, to cleanse us. At the cross, his life was given up like those sacrificial animals. His body was broken, his blood was spilled so that all the wrath of a holy God might be turned away from us and our sin might not be remembered anymore. Not just overlooked, not just kind of uh, pretended it wasn't there, but paid for and dealt with according to God's justice. So that in Jesus we can, we can ask those, uh, those great questions in Romans 8, can't we? Who will be against us? Who will bring any charge against us? Who will condemn us? Who will separate us? And in every case, the answer is if Jesus is standing for us, if his blood speaks in our defence, if he has offered himself in our place, then God really is for us and, and none can overcome what he has done. And so these, these ancient uh, rituals were a reminder of sin, just how relentless it is and our disobedience over and over, day after day, month after month, year after year, our sin is great. But God's mercy is, is more because in Jesus here now is an effective sacrifice for sin all of God's purposes for our salvation were were waiting for this Christ this Messiah to come and deal with our sin and so that phrase once for all in Hebrews is a wonderful uh, way of Hebrews reminding us of the sufficiency of all that that Jesus did not not repeated not needing to be offered again because of our repeated sin but in his death paid for uh, in full so Hebrews uh, uh, 10 
says this and we'll finish with these words hebrews 10 day after day hebrews says and reminds the people every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins but when this priest christ had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin he sat down at the right hand of god the work was done since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy by one sacrifice made perfect forever so praise the lord that jesus has done this for us uh, so today and uh, and this week and uh, next month when we fail and we fall and we sin we ought to uh, mourn that sin we ought to repent of it but we ought to come back again to our savior who's paid the price in full and gives us access into god's presence and is able to present us without fault and with great joy before his throne have you trusted him there's, there's no way to make yourself clean is there there was no way other way for the israelites to do that no atonement we can offer but there is one who has come and offered himself uh, the righteous for the unrighteous the just for the unjust to bring us to god so come to him come to him look to him again uh, trust in him this week when you sin come to him again and uh, seek him and find life in his name amen let me pray lord we thank you for these uh, these scriptures lord which uh, perhaps are, are less familiar to us lord and which uh, we don't read with the same kind of understanding perhaps as we do some of the other parts of your word but we thank you that they uh, point us clearly to jesus again we thank you that these are the scriptures that testify about about him about our savior and so lord as we as we read of uh, of priests and sacrifices lord we thank you that they remind us of our uh, great high priest the lord jesus who offered himself for us and gave his life for us and so lord we thank you that we can come and find life and cleansing and forgiveness and our sins covered and dealt with and we can find fellowship with you, Lord, through him. We thank you that we can come into your presence uh, in this way, Lord. Each of us who've trusted in Christ can come to you. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, you welcome us. Lord, you've uh, called us. And, uh, Lord, we find a welcome in you. And so, Lord, we thank you for our Saviour. We thank you for the gospel. And we thank you, Lord, for your grace to us. Lord, we thank you that uh, your love is unfailing and uh, your mercy is great towards us and so lord we give you all the praise and all the thanks and we ask that you'd help us to remember this lord when we uh, when we fail when we fall when we sin lord may we come uh, always uh, and uh, quickly lord to you and uh, find the help and the grace that we need lord help us we pray bless these things too as we ask in jesus name amen, amen.